pressure looks good. Calling up. Water towers can fly! They go down phenomenal. Watch out for your feet off. Bring it, let's see you dog. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. All right, folks, you know the drill. Let me know that I've clicked on all of the buttons correctly today because it's time for another exciting episode of NSF Live, our weekly Sunday talk show about things that happen in space, peppered with rampant speculation, opinion, and sometimes we play some videos as well. Uh, I'm John Galloway for NASA Space Flight. Let me know that you can hear and see me. I see tons of 5x5s in chat already. Bubba Sun Prime, why you got the 4x4, I don't understand. I appreciate the 10x10 Black Eagle, Eagle Gaming. Thank you for that. 4x6, that math doesn't work, Kevin. Uh, anyways, we're ready to go here today with another NSF Live. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about today as I turn to my right and look at the list of things we have to talk about, including Rocket Lab, <laughs> catching a booster or not catching a booster. What do we think it is? Stay tuned, we'll find out. Uh, ULA and Blue Rocket Hardware Show Off. Got some new information about everybody's mysterious engines. Uh, did I just get quieter? Did I get quieter for everybody, or do I sound okay? Chat. Someone's telling me that I just got quieter. Think we're okay? I think? I think we're okay. Let me know if I'm not okay, chat, which is a 5x5. Five five. Okay. Chris, like, uh, get a Q-tip or something? And like, No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. You're not <laughs> supposed to clean your ears with Q-tips. Uh, <laughs> ingenuity. Ingenuity out on Mars. Everybody's favorite Martian helicopter because it's the only helicopter on Mars. Uh, <laughs> we got some talking to do about that. Starliner rolling out to the pad and shedding unnecessary weight as if it was the Martian. We'll be talking about that as well. Crew 3 came back from the space station. Things are happening at McGregor. And, of course, Starship. you got to say it like that. Y'all have more hair than me. You toss your hair like Starship. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> well, you made me tie mine back for the show today. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. Uh, I, think, I think we're ready to get started here. A lot of people saying woo. Um, everything's good. So let's introduce my friends that are going to be on the show with me today. As I squint to see if I've made their name spelled correctly. I think I did. Chris Gebhart, Assistant Managing Editor for NASA Space Flight. You've seen him before. Chris, how you doing? I'm always here. Direction. I'm doing oh, great. There you how go. are you, Doss? Wait, wait yeah. you got to figure it's out how to like the opposite way you think. Brady basically. bunch it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> at some point, Alex, you're gonna have to do this because we're on both sides of you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, also we have Alejandro Alcant Alcantaria with us as well. Alex, physics. If you know him from Twitter or Discord or something like that, Alex, thank you for joining us today. Yeah. I'm really glad to be here today. All right. Of course, you've, you've seen Alex uh, doing tweets and really keeping good track of the technical information, what's going on with basically everything that's going on. Uh, that's how he wormed his way onto the show today, because <laughs> he knows what's going on. But uh, anyways, <laughs> anyways, I think we've got everything ready to go, so we are ready to start with our first exciting topic, which is, checks the notes, Rocket Lab. Yeah, this was exciting uh, earlier this excited. week. So uh, Rocket Lab launched uh, their mission called There and Back Again. And the rocket looked a little bit different this time. It wasn't the black, you know, carbon composite structure of the first stages. They actually put a, you know, little steel finish on that to uh, help it survive some of the atmospheric reentry uh, heating that it goes through. Uh, and that's because even though Rocket Lab's Electron is a very, very small vehicle optimized for the small satellite market, they now want to reuse this, uh, which is the whole reason that Peter Beck had to eat his hat. Um, <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, and this was actually the first attempt for Rocket Lab to completely recover the booster. And some of you might be wondering, well, wait, why are you guys making a big deal out of this? They've gotten them back before. We've seen the pictures. They've been on the boats. And that's because they've allowed them to splash down before into the Pacific Ocean and then recover them on the boat. But the goal has always sort of been, yeah, the tracking got the a tracking, little wonky geez. during liftoff. We're um, available, yeah. Rocket Lab. We're available. <laughs> 
Um, but basically, this the, the whole idea of how you recover the Electron first stage versus a Falcon 9 is very, very different, right? The Falcon 9 is large, so it has to come down under its own power, sort of make use of those drone ships and land landing pads. But Electron is small. And because it's small, it can actually deploy a parachute and glide down through the atmosphere and then a big old helicopter from rocket lab comes and hooks that parachute and that's how they recover it and they had been sort of testing helicopter proximity operations to descending boosters for a little while but they weren't quite ready to catch it and this week they were and man there was some good suspense because i think we can roll some of the um footage of the actual catch attempt here which is around 15 10 i think 15 15 10 15 10 uh, uh, yeah uh, or sorry 15 minutes ten seconds into the flight okay Um, okay yeah Yeah. um and 15, okay, there's there 30. Was some great, yeah, because oh. there was some great, like, you couldn't see it, couldn't see it, couldn't earlier. see it, and then all of a sudden, just, there it yeah. was, um, underneath the, the catch line. Yes, so this is what we saw for the longest time, and it was just, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it, and then <laughs> there it came, into screen, just like that. They actually did grab it successfully, um, and they did have it under the tow line, and they did snag it out of the air, but what the booster started to do after the helicopter grabbed it didn't quite match the predictions that they had, and in cases like this, helicopter crew safety over everything else, right. and the continued contingency if a catch doesn't go yeah. correct is either you don't move in to try to catch it or if something goes haywire after the fact you just cut the release line right uh, there's a quick release on there and you can just drop it and in this case the parachute is actually still intact on the rocket so it just parachutes down to the ocean where the recovery ship then grabbed it right um, uh, yeah, so this was, but this was big for Rocket Lab um, because they are they are the first company to grab the first stage of a returning booster out of the air like that for eventual reuse. And you know, it sort of shows like Rocket Lab entered this market uh, in 2017 and 2018 very headstrong that it wasn't going to be reusable. Right, reuse was not the answer to how to save money or things like that. And while they're still kind of saying that it's not the answer if you want to save money, they have very much fallen into the understanding of sort of what SpaceX was saying of, yeah, but it, it allows you to fly quicker if you can get your first stages back. Right. Um, you know, regardless of what your independent cost analysis is, you can fly quicker if you can get your first stage back. And Rocket Lab is now transitioning to that with Neutron as well, their larger vehicle from Electron, but a big big day for them uh, i i i think we can all agree yeah you well, know what what was that like for you alex oh yeah sorry oh, go, no go, go ahead, ahead go ahead i was okay. gonna tell a joke so <laughs> oh well now i want to know the joke but <laughs> i i want to know it too okay tell the joke <laughs> no i what i wanted to know <laughs> is why is this right here the video we got stuck with when this video existed <laughs> right <laughs> like this was yeah. somebody's like GoPro yeah. or something, but the Why? actual perspective of the the helicopter coming up to the booster, they could see this a long time before it appeared with that downwards facing camera. But you could tell this is like a cell phone photo or something going out the front, and uh, we were left with the uh, bated breath trying to see if it appeared here, and it eventually did appear. So, anyway. <clears throat> Not really much of a joke. I just want more cameras on the helicopter. Uh-oh. How about you, Alex? <laughs> yeah, more cameras. More cameras. You know, the girls are like, more boosters. And that is like, more cameras. <laughs> it's true. It's yeah. true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was I was a little bit, I don't know, like, confused with the whole thing. Because it seemed like they had caught it. And then it was like, is it is it really caught or something? Like, I had seen all the videos that they had uh, put out of the catching tests and everything. Yep. But... It was actually on the live stream when I thought, hold on, they actually don't snag the parachute. It's like there's something coming out of the tail. parachute. Yeah, the tail yep. that they snag on. And it's like, I, like <laughs> I was expecting the actual parachute to be taken out. And, and somehow when actually looking at the live stream, I was like, huh, I'm silly. This is not that way. This is the other <laughs> way. So it was, yeah, I was a little bit confused there and but yeah, I, I saw one of the frames there in that in that video. You see like the the thing being, you know, moved around, and the, and you can see the booster sort of like mm, 
you know, like vibrating or, it is. or wiggling. It oscillates or a little bit. It oscillates some yeah. after it's in the so very corner. You can corner. see that that it's already on the on the hook by by the helicopter. But yeah, like the, the live video cuts out, and it's like, what happened? <laughs> yeah, we were waiting on, on those right there. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah, which I loved, Alex. Right, because like you 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 saw that you heard all the cheers, and then like right when the video, right when it was out of frame, yeah. or like the live video stopped, you they still had the microphone going in Mission Control, and you heard them all go, "Oh, yeah, Aww. we did hear that." Yeah. <laughs> all right, and then of course, um, the the safety of the helicopter crew, like we said, they made contact with the catch and tail or whatever the technical term for the thing is. Um, they had it for a second. It wasn't feeling good. Should have done some flutter testing on the booster or something like that. And then they decide to, to drop it. And we had Mr. Peter Beck from Rocket Lab, you've seen him on NSF Live before, come out and say, well, it's no big deal. We'll just dunk it in the ocean. Which raised some questions, Peter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you can dunk it in the ocean, why are you trying to catch it in the first place? What did y'all think about that, Chris? <laughs> So this this is one of those weird sort of moments for me where uh context here right is 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 one of those things so um well probably so shouldn't affect the ability to reuse the booster that doesn't really match what we've heard before but i think the context here is is interesting right doesn't affect the shouldn't affect the ability to reuse the booster right like spacex kind of thought maybe after one of those boosters failed to land the one you were here for das one of the cargo resupply flights that yep, yep. ditched into the atlantic um there were some initial questions about whether they could reuse some of that. They did definitely didn't reuse the booster whether engines were reused no one ever really ended up saying shouldn't affect ability to reuse the booster is not oh it's totally fine we can we can still reuse it right that's a lot of salt water intrusion that's a lot of damage that it took that now has to be cleaned uh and maybe components swapped out so maybe the core of the booster sure yeah how much of it because it ended up in the salt water is reusable how much of it is recoverable how much of it would just take longer to be able to refurbish and turn around between right. flights because of it there's a lot to unpack with that um i wouldn't say that's necessarily uh we're gonna pivot to just dumping them in the ocean and catching them and reusing them that definitely doesn't sound like what he said but again never say never and i'm definitely not gonna promise not to eat something if something <laughs> doesn't change with that you know <laughs> That's, and that is the interesting thing because I see some things in chat like, oh, choppers are cheaper than boats. Well, the boat is still there. The idea is not to catch it right. with the helicopter hundreds of miles offshore and then fly it back under the helicopter the entire way. The actual nominal situation was to catch it with a helicopter and then put it down on the boat. And if the seas were too rough, they were going to catch it with a helicopter, dunk it in the water next to the boat, and then have the boat pick it up and put it aboard. So no matter what, it's it's not a, oh, well, we don't need the boat because we have the helicopter. The boat's there anyways, right? Yeah. So I, I think, of course, there were some tweets. Irene Klotz was out there uh, taking quotes from Peter Beck, um, getting some things out on Twitter. And then, of course, Michael <laughs> chiming in with his two cents. Um, it was Peter said <laughs> that adding a dunk in the water shouldn't affect the ability to abuse it. That doesn't mean that they always want to dunk it in the water like clearly this is still right yeah and, and part of that was they're also saying like well half of the launches we can accommodate a helicopter retrieval and about half we can't like they're not going to try to recover them at night but he didn't say so we'll just dunk those in the water next to the boat and grab them he specifically said they can't recover them with the helicopter right and that's been the whole thing. So to then say dunking it in the water shouldn't affect reusability, you know, he did have that follow up that said, we'll see what we end up doing. If it's just a dunk and grab should be fine. That's not the engineering team going, oh, yeah, totally good. You know? Right, <laughs> right, right, right. And I think we did. Uh, they did eventually, after releasing it from the helicopter, they got it back up on the Sea Worker, I think, is their marine they asset. did. That yes. they love, even <laughs> though they don't show it a lot of love. Um, marine <laughs> asset. Sorry. Let me see where that is. Yeah, here we go. Um, they did... Yeah. 
successfully get it aboard the boat. It looked like it had some, what did I tweet, serious brap energy because it looks like the front of a warthog <laughs> to me. Um, too many barrels, I think. Yeah. But uh, they did get it on the boat. They got it back in. I'm sure they'll be looking at it, looking at the salt water that got in, figuring out yeah. how reusable it is. It's still good data, right? Um, oh, 100%. 100%. And, and, and like we said, like this doesn't mean they don't reuse it. It's still great data. And now they've got data on how those things actually behave when the helicopter catches them yep so next time should be better yep you know all right um and so we've talked through that of course it's still a huge thing like catching the booster for the first time on air quotes the first attempt like making positive contact and getting it under it such that it was affecting the helicopter in such a way that they were trying to get rid of it or that they did get rid of it. It was massive just to do that. I mean, we've been catching things falling out of space for a very long time. Some of the first film canisters that came back from spy satellites yes. were actually caught by aircraft and they'd come out of orbit. I guess they'd literally come out of orbit in a canister and pop a parachute and they'd grab them with a plane. But this is the first time, as much as people like to talk about grabbing rocket parts with planes or helicopters this is the first time someone's actually done it so massive congratulations to rocket lab just for making solid contact on the first attempt yeah seriously yeah <laughs> seriously let's see here of course i'm going to see real quick if there's any questions about this it is our live show unless you're watching the vod in which case it was live earlier but you missed it um and let me see if we got some questions or comments about rocket lab elliot dangerous <laughs> nice it's like elite dangerous is <laughs> cousin um thank you for becoming a pad rap <laughs> member we appreciate you and then musical wolves uh the booster caused thrust to weight ratio issues for the helicopter i bet you it was more of an oscillation or momentum yep. issue then they they caught that thing and it just started penduluming back yeah. and forth, back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Or even an unstably moving about the booster center of mass. Even if the booster's mm. going like this on its own center of mass, I'd love to see some more mm. detailed video of the motion or what they were feeling that caused them to pull the red lever, right? I yeah. I assume it's a red lever you pull to let the line loose, but whatever. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, thank you all for the support. Anyway, you slice it. And questions. When is SpaceX going to catch super heavy out of the air using the rock? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, oh, boy. Whew. That was good. I needed that. Uh, <laughs> I caught a, uh, in Kerbal, I caught a Falcon 9 in the cargo bay of a C-130, but uh, I haven't caught a Starship in the anything of anything with the no, rock. So man, dude. I was like, why land it? <laughs> Just was, uh, so that's good. I, I like it. That's funny, but it's also, it was a, um, a proposal back, you know, way back in, in the 60s and 70s yeah. to, to basically catch the Saturn V first stage with a mega massive massive helicopter, helicopter thing you yeah. know like that's that's super crazy <laughs> i, like I crazy understand it. electron is a teeny t- teeny tiny booster and everything yep. but like saturn five first stage that's that's crazy that's bonkers yeah. yeah let me see if i can get a question here uh a bunch of people asking about Starship. Again, if you have questions about other things, we're going to be talking about Starship. We're going to be talking about BE4 engines. We have elusive pictures of. Um, we're going to be Star talking Liner. about this. Starliner as well. Um, let me see. Paul Kelly, a couple people pointed this out. Paul says, I might be imagining it, but those engine bells looked a little dinged up on the back of the ship. And I don't think they were actually dinged up. Peter addressed that, or somebody yeah, they, addressed they that, went. I know. What's it's the, the, the gimbal thing that it just looks like it is. But I think we have a close-up of the I engines. I do, I do. And they are in perfect shape. Yeah. Like, there's no crunch. There's no dinging. Like, it's it's perfect. Yeah, they're not, like, folded in the, half the or that, anything. Yeah. Uh, it's not like, wh- which one? Uh, B-1069, uh, oh. Falcon 9 booster returning oh. back from... Oh. From CRS twenty four crushed engine <laughs> Back bells. In December. Yeah, with with like the, the crunching bells. Yeah, yeah. I, I think some of the early pictures we saw made it look like they were maybe a little dinged up, but it, they thought they were bent, like the nozzles were bent out of shape, and it was just the thrust vectoring was turned off, and they were drooping down. That's part of their degree of yeah. freedom that they can move around, and they were just sort of yeah. in the neutral position or, or the loose position or whatever. Yeah, and that kind of lets you see some things behind them that leads to a yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And they did say, uh, Bak- Bakdu? They did say they dragged or or they caught the line. It was, is it the drug shoot line? 
I don't know if it has another more technical term, the part that they actually catch, but it's not like the oh, hook yeah. just grabs <laughs> the parachute. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Just, it's more yeah, of like just a... Just call it the, the, the taily thing yeah. behind it. Like a cable <laughs> that's like that's intended to be I caught no by idea. the hook. Yeah. Let's see here. Oh, this is a great question, and then we'll move on to, to some other topics. Westy okay. the Third asked, what sort of time frame do they have to catch the falling booster? I know that was a thing. Either of y'all know? Yeah, there's so there's a window that they talked about. Um, I believe it was a three minute catch window or something like that that they said on the. I think it was a bit a bit longer. I think a bit longer Peter than Pick that. Said ten minutes or so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Actually, okay. the timeline. I remember the timeline had it like eighteen minutes after okay. liftoff, and it was caught like fifteen. So they probably had like that eighteen minute mark that they had on the press kit. That was probably sort of in the middle of the window. So they seem to have caught it very early yeah. in the yeah. window. Yeah. Yeah, because because I, I, nice. I know they said it on the stream, but I didn't write it down. Um, mm. But but yeah, there, there's a, there's a maximum altitude and a minimum altitude that the, that the chopper can try to catch the booster at for yep. its own safety and operational limits. And they were sort of guessing based on day of weather conditions, how long would it take the booster to descend through that altitude limit, which, which got you about five. So so theoretically, it does allow for more than one ability to try to catch it right if if you're but it depends on when the first attempt in that window comes right so like if you mm -hmm. try the first attempt right at the beginning of your altitude window and you miss you can probably get another Come one if around. you try in the middle maybe you don't have enough time to circle back or you recycle know like sort of, your catch attempt. recycle exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly it, they exactly. were also going down towards these clouds as well so we noticed like a pretty solid cloud deck underneath the helicopter so i don't know if those clouds were below the minimum altitude or above or, or where this sort of fit in but i think they would not continue to try and catch it if it was in a cloud yeah I, this strikes me as a very since they can't do it at night visually mandatory thing right to right. have mark yeah. one well how do you call it mark one eyeballs mark on one booster. eyeballs yeah mark one <laughs> eyeballs <laughs> Plus, with that other video uh, that we saw of the helicopter oh. approaching it, you wouldn't want to crash into the side of the booster as it was going down, like crash on the parachute or something, if you no, couldn't see it. This is, because this is a good thing to remember, too, right? Rockets do not have running lights. And those ah. things that let you know, hey, yet. this is exactly where I'm <laughs> yet, exactly. Yet. 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 Um, Just wait I, until I Das makes one. one. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I do have one other that I actually held back saying because I thought it might be a question. Um, but I know a lot of people are probably wondering, wait, but like SpaceX like gets their fairings wet. Why can't Rocket Lab get a booster wet? And the answer is sort of, well, SpaceX redesigned those fairings to sort of minimize the amount of salt water intrusion into them when they decided to just go for pure splashdown. And based on how quickly they've reused some of those fairings, there's not a lot of turnaround time that's really needed in the refurbishment process there, but also the electronics on a fairing and the control elements on a fairing much simpler than all of your avionics and all of your control systems and everything that is on an actual first stage booster. Right. All right. And one, this is really, this is a really quick one. Um, I see some people asking the, uh, let's see here about the holes in the parachutes. Right. So why are there holes in one side of the parachute? I'm going to take a guess at it. I am pretty sure that's so that the parachute sort of goes in a direction. Right. So you leave holes in one side, you let air escape that. It almost creates like a, like an air pressure thruster and it makes the helicopter sort of fly or sorry, it makes the, the parachute sort of move in a direction as opposed to just going down and sort of this sort of number. So I have a feeling that the holes in the parachutes, I'm sort of making this up based on a knowledge of physics and falling through the air more than one time in my life. Um, but I think that it's so that the helicopter, or I keep saying helicopter, the parachute maintains stability and sort of moves in one direction as opposed to just sort of going down like a paratrooper or something. Right. Yeah. As I, as I understand it, it's like, you know, if you're familiar with skydiving, right. And you can sort of change the angle of the parachute and that affects your lift to drag ratio. And you can do all of that manually as you're controlling it and coming down. But in this case, it's exactly what you said to us. They, they don't want it coming straight down. They want it moving at relatively the same direction that the helicopter is going to move at to minimize the catch, right. you know, differential between the two vehicles and everything like that. Yeah. Yep. All right. 
Let's see here. That, I think, is a good discussion. Again, as much as we like to pick things apart um, and tell jokes and that sort of thing, just so we understand what's going on with Space News, um, massive congratulations to Rocket Lab for making contact, getting it on the hook for the first time. It's all physics after that. They'll figure out, they get data from it, and they'll figure out how to control the oscillations or whatever was going on with the booster that made the helicopter pilot not feel comfortable. And uh, I have a feeling that we'll all be watching the next time they go for a catch. As opposed to a catch and release. Let's see here. <laughs> Coming <laughs> up. <laughs> it's like fishing. It's like fishing. Good, sorry, they didn't have the right permit to keep the rocket. They had yeah. to throw it back until it got bigger. Um, All right. Let's see. Fall. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, here is one from Jim. It's actually a super chat. Jim, as always, love the work you all do. Jim, thank you so much for the support. MX39, I'm going to I'm gonna look at that. So uh, appreciate you there as well. And let's talk about the next thing, Blue Origin <gasps> and ULA. <laughs> Show and tell days. Kind of what it felt like. Um, somebody, <laughs> yeah. somebody talk about yeah. it. Uh, there, there was definitely a coordinated effort uh, this week um, an uh, to prove that Vulcan is real. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, 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 but those jokes aside, this was actually really good to see, both from Blue Origin and from uh, ULA. Uh, this is one of the qualification motors that they were talking about there that has undergone 2,500 uh, seconds of flight cycle start and full duration hot fire cycles for what it will need to do during its mission. Um, they're not really indicating that they're finding any problems. Um, and, and if you fired it for 2,500 seconds, and actually I think the total qualification engine firings is up to over 5,000 seconds now. That was right. just this engine. Um, I mean, and you shipped ULA theirs minus the nozzle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or we only saw the nozzle or something like that. There was a, it was weird. There was definitely a picture that claimed to be the engine that wasn't the full engine um, that was out there because it was missing all the, the engine-y parts, uh, yeah. basically, like the turbo pumps and I don't everything. I think I have um, that one. Anyway, yeah, this is but a better the point picture. is the engines are real. They actually do exist. They are being test-fired. They are undergoing... Um, uh, and, and they're undergoing their qualification firing campaign ahead of Vulcan's first flight. Tori has tweeted that they have the engines. We've seen Vulcan hardware, the first stage and the second stage um, that's there. So definitely Vulcan is making progress. And that was good to see. And just and, and likewise, as Vulcan is making progress, these are the same engines that will be used on New Glenn as well. So New Glenn, a major element of New Glenn is moving forward as well. Yeah. Um, and what I loved about this in, in the tweet, in the tweetages about all the engines and everything, it was actually Tori's initial tweet that got people to go, dude, Ooh. show us more. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> there was kind of a tweet from Tori that was very much like, I'm not going to show you half the rocket. So then <laughs> people were sort of like, show the whole thing, Tori. Did, did, um, is that, are you talking obliged. about this one? Yeah, yes, I think you're talking about this show. one, yeah, right? That one. Yes. Okay. Which was that one. Vulcan. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, it was like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, so there was definitely like the tight ITAR shot, you know, <laughs> like if NASA were trying to clear something through ITAR for release right now. But then you actually got the this full one. view. And, yeah, and, and I think go. this is where, like, for a lot of people, you know, seeing the flight versions of Vulcan and, um, the tank next to it, which is Delta four, like that sort of gives you a very cool size comparison there between the vehicles and, and stuff. But, you know, it was very good to see Vulcan like this, to see that progress. Cause it is, if the schedules are to be believed going to debut at some point later this year, this year. Uh, yeah. Yeah. With the Peregrine mission to the moon. Uh, so it's a heck of a first flight for Vulcan. Um, and it is, theoretically on tap for later this year. Yep. And uh, they've already applied graphics to it. So it must yes. be, <laughs> it must be coming yeah. right along, I hope. It's the graphics <laughs> for maximum fastness are on. Yes. I was, I was trying to like <laughs> ITAR my way into some trouble over here, but like, yeah, the exactly. pixels are like, just <laughs> not enough to show me what's going on. Like, it's like they know yeah, we might do that. <laughs> I tried to enhance it. I think it. I, I can see 
a, a, a centaur dome like way in the back because it's like shiny. Oh, back shiny there. Means stainless steel. Yeah. 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 Right. Right at the. Uh, yeah. You've got another tank. Some. This right is this background. is like carrying another something. Tank there. Like a, a floor thing that's a circle that you'd put something on and roll it around the shop or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, anyways, um, I think we were all very happy to see some things coming out. Uh, where was that one? Gosh, the GIF. Here's the GIF. We also oh, yeah. got from Blue yeah, Origin. the gimbal check. The waggly yeah. GIF, yeah. Here we go. I hope y'all don't mind me just, like, throwing these things onto the screen like this. Like, I'm not trying to be all smooth and fade them in and out or anything. Uh, let's just watch the gimbal. But they released a GIF of, uh, what is in this one, 8 Degrees? I it says in the tweet, 8 yeah. Degrees, while operating at 100% power level. Yeah, which, I mean, you, you can sort of see, right? Like, you, you sort of get these, oh, the engines can gimbal 8 Degrees, and your thought is really, like, like oh, that's is that it a little bit like yeah. like that's enough that's enough but then you actually see it yeah you know and you can see how much that i mean you you, you have a better sense of how much they actually move there with, with that flame but also that's a lot of thrust coming out of there and yeah eight yeah. degrees like that's its maximum gimbal range if it's gimbling that much during flight it's awesome. We're, it's awesome, <laughs> but we're encountering some wind shear on the way some up that we weren't exactly shear. hoping to fly through, basically. <laughs> I just, I mean, if somebody could do the math on this, because you got eight degrees, and you could figure out the length of the exhaust plume, and it's 150 feet or whatever. Yep. And Alex, do it in your head. Um, you could, what is, you could figure out the difference in how high the end of the plume would be if you pointed up eight degrees and then 150 feet downrange, how far off the ground does it become? I can't do that in my head. I could probably like put in a Wolfram Alpha or something and ask. But uh, Chad, yeah, do the math. It's a fun STEM experiment or a STEM activity for today with comments. your family. Yeah, put the answer in the comments or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways, um, it was cool to see. There's one thing that I want to address because everybody seemed to want. Let's de-enhance that a little bit. Um, <laughs> everybody was like, oh, ha, ha, look at the engine. It looks like a plate of pasta or whatever. And we've talked about this before. We've said it to you. We've seen Raptors that have lost a lot of wiring and stuff like that between a development Christmas engine tree. and, and the Christmas tree, right? And then they get cleaner. And <laughs> when you're working on building your first engines, you have all sorts of instrumentation slapped on this. I mean, you could literally see stuff that is seemingly taped to the side. That looks like tape on the yeah. side of it. And then it, like, yeah. it goes into this wiring harness that get, look at all these wires going up into here, right? But we've also seen that on Raptor too. We so have, like, you know, yes, <laughs> these wires going in the side, like with tape, it's like, yep. Why? I've, I've, yep. We've yeah, seen that, all... but that's a normal thing for the engines. Exactly. Like you're gathering data, you put sensors all over the thing. One day you ship a nice clean engine that doesn't have all the sensors, but it's a normal thing to sensor the heck out of the rocket engine so you can gather tons of data when you're firing it. So I know everybody and, likes to be, oh, go ahead, and Chris. The ro and the rocket too, because one of the things that SLS has to come back to the VAB for after its wet dress rehearsal is to have a whole bunch of sensors taken off because when it goes through wet dress, they want to know when you load cryogenic into the core how do the booster casings yeah, flex move. and move well all of that has to be instrumented but then you got to take all that instrumentation off because it'll just be ripped right off the vehicle if you leave it on for liftoff and you don't want that and you know same with here instrument the heck out of your engine when it's on the test stand because yep. yeah are limited in what you can instrument it with when it's actually on a rocket. I just, I know everybody loves to dunk on Blue Origin and then Blue Origin shows us something really cool. And if your reaction yeah. is to continue to dunk on them, like, come on. I like seeing rocket engines. I want to see this thing fi I want to see more video of it firing. I want to see the video of it gimbling. Like, I don't want to have them tweet something, and then everybody in their smart, snarky dog wants to score points on Blue Origin by saying something snarky in the comments. Like, please show us more. Don't convince them that they yes. shouldn't show us more. Oh. Yeah. Oh, please show us more. Show us more. And, and I think this is another moment to, you know, with Blue Origin to stop and say, you know, like, we do need to separate out the management issues that have caused a lot of the delays, right? Versus what the engineers are building and designing and learning from uh, at the end of the day. Because the engineers definitely know what they're doing with these engines. They're not just throwing stuff on and seeing what yeah. works, right? Everything's there for a reason right now. Somebody was out there and they taped all of those sensor cables to that engine. Don't hurt their feelings. They worked hard on it. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Let me 
let me see if we can't grab some questions here. Um, oh, Dank Jeb has done some math for us. I didn't verify this myself. But Dank Jeb says with an 8-degree gimbal and a 150-foot-long exhaust plume, the end of the plume would be about 21 feet off the ground. Two stories. Does there anybody confirm or deny that? I didn't, like, double-check your math. I trust you, Dank Jeb. I trust that you did the math. I correctly. mean, that should that should just be the Pythagorean Seems theorem, like... right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So well, if you know A squared and we C know squared, the... you should be able to get B. We know the I mean, length of the sides. Yeah. But I yeah, do, so Pythagorean just... doesn't give you the angles. Oh, well, whatever. Some <laughs> Something. The yes. length of whatever. I don't know. Some ma math term. Um... Is, Alex, <laughs> is Alex doing the math? Alex is looking down like he's doing the math. Are you doing the math? <laughs> Sneakily doing the math? Oh, you're looking I'm at the comments. People looking like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> the math looks good. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Mike Smith, I definitely forgive those that aren't rocket scientists. They're doing all... All the math right now. <laughs> Everybody in chat, show your work. If you're in chat, show your work. Um, let's and see don't here. tell me how wrong I was because I know I don't do math well in my head. Like, that's, that's all good. Um, <laughs> the only reason I know that I even like know the Pythagorean theorem is because I was helping my daughter with it a while back, and it's like, is wait, that how does that work again? Plus b squared equals c squared. Oh, no, that or is whatever work. Yeah. Okay. Is, that is, is Pythagorean, yeah. but it's the length of the sides that you're solving for there, not the angle. Pythagorean assumes you right, have a right angle it, in there. But isn't but aren't you solving for the lengths? If you know the length of the flame going out and you know the oh, but you've got an angle. No, but yeah, yes. you know the length that's and the with, length and the, Yeah, no, I see what that's you mean. With I'm wrong. Trigonometry. Yep. yep, I see trigonometry, I, you know, with I got the, with there. the sine and the cosine of the angle. It's it's just such a mess. So what we've established <laughs> mathematics. is Chris remembers something from high school math but not the right thing. So moving on. Um, <laughs> this is actually a great time to do a plug for Brilliant.org. No, I'm kidding. Yes, We're not it is. For brilliant .org. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go and see if they have a course on Didn't finding the... Apparently, I could do a few. <laughs> finding the angle of a yeah, triangle. I mean. or... <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> let's see here. Sakatoa. Yes, I remember Sakatoa as well. Um, let me see if there's another question here. Vulcan is real. Isn't that just a painted silo in a tube rat's nest with a cone? Thank you, Jacob. We appreciate the comment. Um, Vulcan is a planet. It's located a few light years from here. Like... <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, and that was... Uh, was there something special about that? Wiggle, 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 yeah. Um, that Delta Four. Like there was actually a f Delta Four tank on one side, right? That is a Delta Four tank uh, to the side of it. Yes. Was it a specific it might be one? one of the last? Like one of the probably last one of the last, last flight fly. ones. Yeah. 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 So it doesn't look right. It doesn't have its orange paint job on it. I would never guess that it was a uh, Delta Four tank. It also doesn't have its liquid oxygen tank. That's just the hydrogen tank for it. There you uh, go. Yeah. Right now. Make yeah. it orange. You they can need to make it orange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually see the uh, hydrogen vent uh, up at the top of it. There. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah. I need to get some Sophie on there so I recognize it. Um, <laughs> exactly. That's what they look like when they're first born. Uh, <laughs> when they're first born. <laughs> Let's see it's a here. Baby Delta Four. <laughs> Adrian will be proud. Hasn't got its feathers yet, or whatever. Speaking of feathers, no. Um, I won't bring up the bluebirds. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I will bring up the words. What's our next topic here, folks? Back to the links document. Ah, ingenuity. Yeah. Scary times. Ingenuity. In ingenuity land, right? Yeah. So ingenuity is the helicopter that Perseverance took with it uh, when it went to Mars and landed last fe uh, February of 2021. And uh, for some context, Little Ingenuity, the Mars helicopter, was basically supposed to be around for 30 Martian days or 31 Earth days, and it was supposed to fly five experimental test flights. It's been a year, it's conducted close to 30, and it's flown 6.9 kilometers or 4.2 miles across the Red Planet. It has actually investigated the Perseverance back shell and some of the landing equipment that it jettisons as it's coming down to the surface uh, to get ready for its landing. It has vastly outperformed anything that they thought it would actually do. Uh, much like almost everything we send to Mars, basically, once it gets there. Um, I mean, if it gets there and it lands successfully, there's a huge history of it outliving by a long pace uh, what its uh, intended lifespan is. But very crucially, on May 3rd, um, or the 427th day of its 30-day mission, um, it didn't communicate back to Earth like it was supposed to. 
And this was odd. It was the first time that that hadn't happened. And they eventually reestablished communication with it and discovered that it was a, it entered into a low power state. So basically its solar arrays were recharging its battery. It didn't recharge as fast. So the helicopter's field programmable gate array basically got powered down to save as a power saving um, method. And this is basically what the craft is designed to do when it gets into these low power periods. And they did eventually trace the cause of the low power to basically the fact that the amount of dust in the Martian atmosphere where Perseverance and Ingenuity are, it's arcing toward um, winter at that place in Mars. And dust increases in the Martian atmosphere in winter. And that meant less sunlight was actually getting there to the solar is. arrays. Um, so that was the cause of it. They've got it back um, uh, now and they're working on a, a plan for like how to do this. They already kind of are how to fix this and how to mitigate this, but they also kind of know, which is really neat, that they can use the rotors um, on the craft to sort of blow away dust on the solar arrays. So unlike um, Spirit and Opportunity, which, which were just sort of at the mercy of Martian winds to clean their solar arrays, um, we can actually kind of clean the ingenuity arrays to some regard, which they didn't actually anticipate before its launch. So um, while the battery is healthy and is at 41% of full charge, you know, we're going to have to sort of contend with low power operations here on ingenuity as they get toward Martian winter. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> Chris, I was laughing earlier because you, you were you were saying, you know, like everything they send to Mars, JPL, no one believes you anymore. You're like, oh, uh, I don't know. I guess it'll fly for 30 days. And then all of a sudden, like 29 flights or 28 flights later and vastly over, like years later, the rover's still driving and the wheels are falling off. And it's like, whatever, I got another rock to drill. Um, yeah, when, when Perseverance was four, or sorry, when, uh, when Opportunity was 14 and a half years yeah. into a three-month mission. Yeah. <laughs> it's like JPL's mission, estimated mission timelines have the least credibility of anything from any NASA agency that anybody puts out because they're <laughs> consistently beating them by orders of magnitude. <laughs> yes. So, talk about <laughs> under promise and over deliver. Um, but that is, that is good. I mean, joking aside that the, the helicopter um, has vastly outperformed expectations. Uh it going to sleep and losing the clock, then missing a check-in and all that sort of stuff. Um, they sort of knew that that was something they were going to deal with, or they were going to have to deal with, I guess. Which tips you off that they expected it to make it into the dusty season. Um, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> um, yeah. it's good that they and were able to sort of explain yeah. what was going on. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Now, now, the thing to keep in mind is that we could very well be headed for Ingenuity's end. Um, as much as we grow personally attached to these things and, you know, you can get emotional when their missions come to an end, uh, you know, like keeping every, keeping the battery levels charged to survive the night is going to start to become a problem right here. Um, because heaters activate once it gets to 15 degrees Celsius to keep certain things warm. Those batteries are a huge, those, those, uh, heaters are a huge drain yep. and the batteries aren't really charging to and full right now. So we don't want to make this out to be like ingenuity's fine. We reestablish communication. Everything's good. There can be a plan, but you know, if the solar panels aren't dusty, there's nothing you can do, but watch how much the battery charges and then watch how much it drains during the night. Right. You and know. it, it needs to be kept warm over the freezing Martian night. And it, it got through one yep. just fine, but the more and more that that happens and they have to go to full shutdown instead of heater mode, the more it can affect those batteries. And one day it may wake up, it may decrease their, it may not wake up. It does have six batteries on board. So you can lose probably a cell and continue on with other cells at d diminished capacity, but I don't know what the capacities are. Um, or if they'd have enough volts with the, with losing a cell or something like that but uh it is possible i mean heck if the problem is that the dust covers the solar arrays and not that ingenuity tried to do a barrel roll and crashed into a rock um, yeah <laughs> if the reason is that the dust and not a helicopter crash on mars that's still an amazing job by the team um i figured like something would go wrong it lands on a rock and tips over and can't or something right but if it's yeah. just dust good job team yeah, well, and, 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 you know, it might not even be dust, you know, like dust is a very common thing, right? But it might not even be dust. Pers um, uh, sorry, I keep saying perseverance because it's the new rover. Uh, Spirit and Opportunity, the last ones that relied on solar arrays, when it got to winter on the respective hemisphere that they were, they were on, they would actually find a hill 
and park the rover on a hill for the winter with its solar arrays angled more toward the sun lower on the horizon. Yep. You can't do that with ingenuity. You could so try, that's going to decrease you the do amount that. of energy. You don't want right. to park your helicopter on a hill. Uh, like, right. Don't do you that. Can't. Right, so you can't do that with ingenuity. You can't park your helicopter on an angle to angle its solar arrays. That was so. but yeah, but but all that is to say that that's the update on ingenuity and yes. what it's been up to and what we hope it will continue to be able to do. But we kind of need to see how it does over the next couple of weeks. Yep. Uh, let's see here. I'm looking for some more questions about ingenuity and musical wolves. Thanks for the super chat. I guess it answers where are my engines. <laughs> They're right there. It didn't seem like Tori was ever really concerned about where his engines were, um, but he is the CEO. So, Musical Wolves, thank you so much for the super chat. And I think I got the one from Jim. Uh, as always, love the work you do. I think I already got that one. I just forgot to mark it off. Questions. Let's see here. <laughs> yes, they did not pack a feather duster to try and dust off the solar rays. Not a thing. <laughs> um, how long do you think it would last without flying? I didn't see well, that so in the release, did you? Yeah, so that's sort of the thing. It's not going to fly anytime soon because the batteries are having trouble keeping enough charge to get through the night um, with everything. So um, the, the, the sort of release didn't really, unless I totally missed it, the release did not really talk about, this is when it's going to fly again. It's very right. much like, we got to see if we can get it through the next you know, few days and really understand where that battery level is going to be at. So we understand what it's going to do throughout the Martian winter, where it is. Ah, uh, gotcha. And there, somebody, that's that's what I said out loud and then thought, thought, thought about. Uh, Quizacodal said the cells in the battery for the prototype were all in series, so it's unlikely to work if, the, if one fails. Thank you for that. That was the piece that there I was missing, and I said it out loud, and I was like, well, wait a second. It depends on how it's put together. Thank you yeah. for that. Um... Do you, oh, here's an interesting one. Cy Walder asked, do you think in the future it would be better to send a team of drones to Mars instead of a rover? Uh, well, um, I think this is sort of what they're starting to maybe realize, right? Is, and, and, and I'm going to answer this in a couple of ways, right? Ingenuity was supposed to be this like, ah, let's see if it works. Um, right. Because there's the Dragonfly mission from NASA to the Saturnian moon of Titan that's coming up later in the decade, early next decade, I think is the actual liftoff um, for Dragonfly or the targeted liftoff for Dragonfly. But that is a quadcopter rover sized SUV car that is basically a gigantic drone that will fly from one science location to the other on Titan. Now, Titan is smaller than Mars, so it's easier, you know, blah, 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 blah. The higher the gravity field, the more it needs, you know, all of that. Earth is, uh, you know, Mars is smaller than Earth, so it's a little bit easier. And now that we sort of understand how these rotorcraft are flying in tenuous atmospheres, right? Because like sea level, the sea level, right? Um, right. You know, the zero level on Mars, whatever we call that, actually, uh, zero is, elevation level, base zero datum? elevation. I've I've always said datum altitude. Like you got to define something as the base altitude, whether it's a sea or not. I don't know if that's exactly. a real term. I, yeah. I maybe I don't know, but, uh, but but basically the the equivalent is like where ingenuity is. As soon as it leaves the ground, it's the equivalent of flying at a hundred thousand feet on Earth, and no rotorcraft has flown higher than fifty thousand feet right. on Earth. So like, it's hard. But I think seeing the success of ingenuity, knowing that this is coming with Dragonfly, I wouldn't be surprised if there were studies, but now the Martian gravity field is what I'm not sure about. Like how much power do you need? How much automation do you need? Are we really there in that yet? Cause that's a lot of what ingenuity has been testing yet, but I wouldn't say never at this point. Right. And there's also the problem. Oh, no, go I was, ahead. Go I was ahead. about to say that there's also the problem of the size of the helicopter, because if you think about it, these like the ingenuity, ingenuity helicopter, sorry. Uh, it doesn't have really a lot of scientific uh, payload. It's just like a, a couple of cameras, right? And you think that's like, even that that alone is okay, but at least if you're going to send something to Mars, you at least will want to carry some kind of payload, even if it's like a couple of kilograms of payload. <clears throat> but of course, <laughs> that's the, that yeah, that's super on point. If you're going to carry... Uh, a few, even a few kilograms of payload, like Ingenuity is one kilogram. 
So you're talking about something that needs to be even bigger, larger with bigger blades, you know, and everything like the Mars Science helicopter proposal that we're seeing right now on yep. screen. So yep. like, you need a really massive, uh, you know, kind of, kind of drone to be able to do any meaningful science. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, you could, you could probably send a lot of them, but then you will probably need like, like the, the logistics are a little bit complicated. Right. Whereas you can probably send one as, as, as it is shown there, like you, you probably even use one of these where we actually send people to Mars right. just for scouting and you send it off. Even if it's, you know, once we actually have better IA and all of that, like you can even think about them being, you know, scouters while the crew are sleeping or, you know, you can basically imagine many, many things, but the problem is, they're not going to be anywhere the size of ingenuity. They're going to be much larger. Right. So the logistics are going to be way different. You cannot send just like a futilla of them and, and be like, hey, we're sending them off because they're not going to be as tiny as ingenuity. This is, they're going to be way larger. Yeah. And I think another big point there is uh, ingenuity doesn't operate in a vacuum. It's close because it's Mars, but what I actually mean is that it talks through the rover, and the <laughs> rover is what sends its signals yeah. the rest of the right. way. So. Even with the very limited payload, which is no scientific payload, it just has its nav case cameras and stuff like that, right? And that's mm -hmm. the science. Like, can we actually fly this thing here? Um, it doesn't have, like, long-range communication equipment to talk all the way back to Earth or anything like that. It still needs the base station, and it uses the rover as the uplink. So in terms of, exactly. you know, all sorts of sci-fi things, like a backpack helicopter that Mark Watney just takes out and throws into the or whatever, <laughs> right? Like, you can think of all sorts of cool things, and I'm sure we'll get there one day. Uh, not quite there yet, but it is really cool to think about. Exactly. Let's see. Maybe, are we on time? We're okay on time. <laughs> Let's see if we get uh, one more. We are. A lot of the questions I'm seeing we've been talking about, like the weight limits and this heavy science equipment, you have to send more stuff, like all those types of things y'all are talking about. Um, yep. You've done a lot of things. <laughs> they stole a battery to power their portable phone. I'm pretty sure the Martians didn't steal a battery. <laughs> um, <laughs> Needs a charge station on the rover. Remember, the rover is very much separate from the helicopter. So they're not doing something like, let's do a flyby and buzz the rover with the helicopter or a beauty shot, like 360 degrees. They're, they've actually got a keep out zone around the rover and they can't fly. They have agreed not to fly Ingenuity anywhere around this keep out zone where the rover is operating because you don't jeopardize. I'm going to say the primary mission, the rover there with the helicopter doing cool 3D stunts in the Martian atmosphere or whatever, right? Um, they do have a keep out zone, so you're not going to like fly it over and land it on the rover or use the use the rover somehow to clean off the solar panels or whatever, like plug them together or whatever. They're completely separated in this design. Um, physically, does use the communications link to to actually talk back home. Uh, let's see here. Shall we go on to the next thing here, which is Crew Three? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Behind Alex there. Crew there you go. I'm talking. Oh, I didn't even have to show it. Juice. I'm cheating. You've already but, got it. Uh, Look, we've got two uh, angles now. We've got the front on angle and we've got the side angle. <laughs> uh, but Crew yeah, this was, this, was, this was the last step in the long, long choreograph <laughs> from Axiom 1 to this Uh of how to do these, of how to coordinate these three uh, Crew Dragon missions. Um, Crew 3 was launched back in November of 2021. Uh, long duration stay of Raja Shari, Thomas Marshburn, Kayla Barron, and Matthias Maurer of the European Space Agency um, up to the International Space Station. Um, they were originally slated to come back earlier this month, but the Axiom launch to the station needed the docking port that Crew 4, which is Crew 3's replacement, uh needed so we basically had to wait for axiom to launch and then come back and axiom had all of those delays for weather and everything which pushed crew four back and then eventually got us to this week which was crew three coming back um in early may they uh, successfully undocked from the iss spent about a day uh thereafter in orbit of the earth and then came back nice and safe uh, landing uh, in the Gulf of Mexico off of Tampa, Florida in uh, uh, back on 
Ooh, Friday, early Friday morning. Technically, it was uh, 1243 uh, a.m. on Friday morning. Uh, all three of them uh, did well after they came back. This was video of Dragon screen after uh, it had come through the plasma stage of reentry. Um, this is actually right before the parachutes popped out, which is always to me the moment when you start hearing them go, you know, brace for drogue window and then you just don't see the drogues for a while and you're like right right right. they said brace for the window brace for the window you know like you, <laughs> your your mind starts playing tricks with you when you're waiting for the parachutes to come out on this <laughs> on these craft um but they landed safely under four good main parachutes that had been a slight issue with the crew two landing um where they came down on only three that was not seen again with crew uh, with crew three's landing, uh, four good mains as they came down. So, um, yeah, and wrapped up a good, um, jump forward. So <laughs> there we go. There yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, wrapped up a good mission to the international space station there with a uh, crew four now on orbit, uh, as their, uh, successors on board the station. So all good with crew three. Yep. And, uh, I wanted to bring this up real quick because I know quite a few people have shown, or I guess have commented that it looks very much like a toasty marshmallow. <laughs> yes, it does. It looks like a perfectly <laughs> toasted marshmallow. Somebody should try and put like a little camp fork in it or something like that. But uh, anyway, right. yeah. <laughs> these are actually these are actually from the the NASA HQ photo Flickr album over there. I could toss that into chat real quick. That's me. If y'all want to look at more of those, there. I don't think this doesn't actually show the diver diving off the top, right? Like everybody's favorite, oh. like event during a dragon capture yes. now. <laughs> Even the... did a sign or something like, hey, hey yeah, <laughs> jumped. I want to see him do a backflip or something one of these times. Like, <laughs> don't do that. Your job is really cool, and I don't want you to get in trouble. Famous. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. So that was crew three, I believe. I think the hey, other. Yes thing we covered was a Starlink launch. Alex, you tweeted some interesting stuff about this Starlink launch, didn't you? Oh, did I? <laughs> I thought you did. Was, Wouldn't this... There's, there's, there's been many Starlink flights lately that okay. I cannot remember if I did or something. Was this the one that uh, was super early? That's the one you and I did, yeah. Doss. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, so, this was... Go ahead. Yeah, this was, uh, what was this? Uh, this was Starlink 417. Yes, yes. <laughs> I say that on for the screen event, because there are so many of them at this point. Um... <laughs> Wasn't this a cool shot, though? I couldn't resist. This really was. It's the booster in the <laughs> foreground being being uh, set up by the crane, I guess, or it was just hanging on the crane at that point. And then the other booster in the background taken off. And the other part I really loved about this is you could see the humidity in the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. Like, it's like there are times when we say, right, like, oh, my gosh, the humidity that you don't see before the engines just light it up all around you uh, and, and, and everything. Uh, that, that shot really gave the context here because it went into the clouds very quickly um, there. But then we got that beautiful shot of the sort of a – the jellyfish back illuminating the clouds, which yep. was something that we really hadn't seen before. Yep. As it was just, uh, you know, and the booster continuing to flicker uh, there as it, as it did its job. It was, it was a gorgeous launch. I know it just looks like a back black screen right now, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that one of course uh, went up. I don't, do we have another Starlink coming I do up? Know, Go ahead, Alex. I think, yeah, because you said something about the, uh, tweets i don't think i tweeted anything but i think this one if i remember correctly also from the live stream i think we talk about this one being the fastest turnaround time for 39a ah so is even, that what even i was remembering for shuttle and everything okay yeah this was the the, the fastest one it must have been so another another launch where you were talking about the turnaround time or something like that starlinks yeah that was the previous one oh because my this gosh. is like records after records you know this is just like <laughs> Every day, just being. This broken. was a. Uh, this was the record for Pad A. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Pad this a. was the record for Pad A. Who yes, can keep uh, up? Nine something days between Crew Four and this one. So yeah, there was a record, but it was for the up. Pad, not okay. SpaceX. Yes. <laughs> All yes. right. <laughs> thanks, thanks for getting my back there on that. Yeah, nine um. days and something. I don't, I don't remember. I have the data over here, but. 
I just cannot find there's it. There's always a record, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, there's always a record. I'm um, actually waiting um, from Pat 40, the, the other launch, they, they, they've um, put like a, like a week or two more because we saw on the previous one, they had a turnaround break, uh, Pat turnaround mm-hmm. record also. But now we're seeing like 17, well, at least previously it was 17 days of a spacing between launches from Pat 40. And, and, and it was like, that's a long gap Eight. now, nowadays yeah. it, it's like, yeah. Uh, but, but now they, they have brought back that, that launch and now it's going to be uh, next week. I think Michael also tweeted that it's going to be landing right in the middle of Bahamas. Oh so yeah. That's going to be a little bit weird to look at. Before. Yeah. Uh, Dust. Yes. Want to have want to have our land overflight convo about a rocket? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> uh, well, actually, I mean, uh, well, that's the next one out of Florida. When is the next one out of Florida, Alex? Um, Starlink Group Four Four Fifteen. That's going to be next week, and it's actually going to fly on a new booster. So it's going to be B ten seventy three flying on the first for the first time. And then that's the landing zone, which is like right in the middle of Bahamas. We saw previously they did that like a dog leg around, yeah. but now it's like straight down the middle. Yeah. We don't care about this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, no dog leg. This is basically, we are pitching right onto the azimuth and out we go. Right on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll this, ask. This, yeah. <laughs> Is this not a trajectory that they fly very often? Like, could you, instead of a drone ship, have a landing pad in the Bahamas somewhere? Or it's just they don't fly that trajectory enough for that to make any sense? Like a land landing pad, not the drone ship? Yeah. I I don't know if this comes down. Yeah. And and to be fair, I don't know. um, So if you put a landing pad, you then need an exclusion zone. You then need security. You then need all this. How much land space is actually available on the Bahamas for something like I don't that? Know. Yeah, I'll go um, look if you want. Like NSF, can yeah, fly like, down there, and I'll go NSF check it out for you. <laughs> hey, I hear there's a hotel called the Atlantis. We can connect that right there. there. You uh, go. Can you know. send Jack with a kayak. You know? <laughs> send Jack with a kayak. Yes, but but I mean, this is this is pretty. This is pretty impressive. I mean, because that is basically a lot of faith in what the Bahamian government has basically seen. I mean, and I would imagine they would want data to allow this because this is an incredible land overflight because at a certain point, right, you're, you're still high enough where you're technically not in Bahamian airspace. Right. Right. Like it's sort of that weird thing. Like once you get to space, you can overfly a country because you're not in their airspace. Right. Right. But at a certain point as you're descending, you are in their airspace. So like there has to be coordination with air traffic control. There has to be all these things and you are coming over populated islands. Um, So that is, (laughs) <laughs> and it's a rocket. And now, now, granted, the Falcon 9 is not firing its engines as it comes over that, right? I mean, like yeah. the actual first stage burn of the booster will be done before it actually overflies. But it is overflying land. Um, yeah. It- and I mean, I mean, and maybe they found a way to like get that dead center trajectory perfect. But of course, you know, the higher you are, if you have a failure of the rocket high up in altitude, that does spread. The das is already looking out for a spot to put a camera. Yes, exactly. Das is <laughs> looking for the spot for the camera. Like, yeah. This uh, is all <laughs> <on> air. Like, <laughs> I don't know how old this imagery is, but this looks like an undeveloped area. Um, there's a lot of roads and cul-de-sacs and stuff, but I, I don't actually see houses. Of course, this could be old or, imagery that I'm looking at. I just brought up Google Maps. But this could also terrifyingly be places we, where homes used to be before hurricanes uh, came over. Also true. Yeah, I, I don't know the history of this area, but yeah. if, if I squint down you know, to 2020 on this map, it's going across the thick part of the island there, and it looks like it's sort of uninhabited. Yeah. I don't know if that played into it at all. I mean, right. You know who we need for this? Harry Stranger. There you go. With the satellite <laughs> yeah. pictures. No, I'll go down yeah. there and check yeah. it out in person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, Might I'll, bring a camera or two. I'll go drive on this road, <laughs> and I'll tell you if there's houses there. It's fine. We don't need satellites. Come on. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but anyway, that is something to look forward to for this coming week, a Falcon 9 landing that will no longer skirt the Bahamas, but actually, th- I mean, not even thread that needle, just 
go right over them and right into them for landing. Which yep. okay, it's also interesting because they have been doing like they, they were doing the southeast, then back to northeast, and now suddenly a, a one like this. This one is actually the only one lately because like four fourteen, four sixteen, four seventeen, four eighteen. We even have an FCC file for four nineteen. All of them are already going north. And this one, right in the middle of all of these, is going to the southeast. And it's like, we don't know now, why. It, now, when is when is the actual day of that launch? May um, what? May 13th. Ah, okay. Two something a.m. I don't remember. Uh, okay, okay, cool. Time. Oh, that blows what I was going to say. So never mind. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, it's also going to be during nighttime. So there's going to be awesome views from that island. Yeah. I'm That's true. Oh, that. people in the Bahamas better be warned about that. Yeah, I could be people in the Bahamas. Just watching just, you know, yeah. on Twitter, <laughs> tagging us and everything so we can right. see it. We show it off next time. <laughs> I'm very sad we, we don't have super chats that is like, send us the Bahamas hashtag or anything like that. Come on, y'all. Jeez. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> moving right along, we have like 25 minutes left in the show yeah. here, so we do have some more stuff to talk about. Big in the news, it looks like uh, Starliner, in an attempt to increase its efficiency, has come up with some ways to lose <laughs> mass. Decreasing the dry mass of Starliner means that it'll go further. Whatever. Uh, it was rolling okay, out to, to the dock pad. With the this time around. Chris, you know I'm starting with this, right? Like I'm just going to. Oh, I knew you were week. starting with this because this is this is what everyone oh, saw this week. And I admit, my first thought when I saw this was. Oh, what? the optics right uh, there. But that was that, was, that was not the only thing. Yeah. No, because, no, it wasn't. What was the first yeah. thing, Alejandro? Yeah, the first thing was the SPMT that is carrying the the Starliner vehicle. It had a hydraulic leak yeah. right off, like after leaving the hangar, and they were holding for like three or four hours. It was yeah, uh, <sighs> yeah. It's, so. This it's is, not a this big is, deal, but it's just like yeah. right, uh -huh. right. Again, it was, just, it was just one of those things. It was Starliner, it was Boeing, so of course anything that didn't go right was going to be the big story. But we need to stop for a second to say it was the SPMT that had the hydraulic leak. Nothing leaked on Starliner, and that, Sadly. in all honesty, is a ground <laughs> transport door that is used to protect the actual vehicle as it's being moved. It's not flight hardware. It's not like, oh my God, they couldn't bolt something on. How's it going to survive lift? I, that was never going <laughs> to actually lift off with the vehicle. Um, and that's not a joke based on how they put it on. That was seriously right. never going to lift off with the vehicle. Right. Um, nothing went wrong with Starliner on its move. So that's the important thing to mention here. But um, what was very good about this though, is, you know, like Starliner got there, it got mated that same day, ULA had photos, they're on track from other things that we have seen um, officials saying for a lot liftoff no earlier than May 19th, which was itself pulled forward by one day from May 20th. Um, so I think here's the part of the joke I'm gonna make now. Assuming this service module can survive the humidity of a Florida summer, we might be on track for a liftoff on May 19th. Uh, we'll have to see. Um... Just put an umbrella. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It'll be fine. <laughs> Roll it out with a little raincoat. Like... <laughs> yeah. Put in a bid to wrap yes. the thing in plastic or something. Um, but it is it is good progress, y'all. Of course, yeah. we're kidding around. We saw, like like Chris said, we saw yeah. the door come off the side, and we're like, oh my gosh, please, Starliner can't catch a break. <laughs> we want to see Starliner fly. We need more ways to get astronauts into space. To the space yep. station, we don't just want to be a one-trick pony with only one way to do it. And so every different thing that happens, we still want Starliner to make it to orbit. We want to see it see it successful. Um, yep. Want to see it fly, you know? Yeah. And like I said, we're just I like, wanna, oh, my gosh, I want to see it please. do what it's designed to do, right? I want, I, yeah. I want to see it at the ISS. I want to see it dock. I want to see it launching people. Yep. Um, if OFT2 goes well in May, uh, crew flight test potentially by the end of the year for yep. Starliner as well. Like, let's get this going. Let's get her certified. Let's see what Starliner is actually capable of doing. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, right, let me see real quick if there's maybe one or two. I'll grab some super chats. Ken, appreciate the Curly L's Das Bahama Cam Fund. 
thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Berg as well. Das Bahama Fund 2022. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Musical Wolves <laughs> is singing a tune that I don't understand. How big of an issue is it that Starliner threw it out the window, the window, the second story window? Is that a song? No idea. Huh. Uh, so, so copyright, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it is. Case. I'm not aware of it. Yeah. Know. Anyways, <laughs> I feel like it's a baby in the bathwater <laughs> reference. Uh, Tom, Tomas, or Tomas, thank you so much. Says, nice cup, Chris. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. James Wilson says, please hit the likes if you actually do like the show and you're not just sitting there groaning at us constantly. Uh, there's a little thumbs up thing you can <laughs> click and let other people know that it may be worth watching. And the musical was a little bit ago was the Wait, crew. Th- or even if you are groaning along with us, because if you're groaning along with us, you're staying, which means you like it. Exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, the musical wolves also said was crew three Cinco de Splasho, the first splashdown where the astronauts <laughs> weren't walking off the capsule all on stretchers. Was that something of note for that recovery? The, um, they uh, so yeah. I mean, the, the things I will say to this is it it's it's sort of it sort of goes by how the individual astronaut is feeling um, they and how long they've been up there. Um, uh, you know, Russia definitely doesn't let them walk out of that Soyuz there. They're always carried around because that's how they prefer to do it for, for our crew return missions. We do give a, we do give the option. If the astronaut feels like they are stable enough to get up and walk out of the capsule on their own, they are allowed to do that. Um, if they feel like they can't, there are stretchers uh, available for them. It doesn't mean anything aside right. from that. Now, I will also point out that sometimes, you know, some, some of the things that we test for, some of the experiments are happen at times of flight that we don't normally assume are portions of the flight where the astronauts are engaged in some sort of medical test, right? Like lift off and landing, you don't assume they're doing these these things. But the fact that, but, but you know, like when you see an astronaut come out on a stretcher, it could be that they were, that NASA medical was trying to say, we want you to do something different than the others. We want you to do something different than you did the first time you flew, because we want to see how that changes your your response, right? The the sort of field of, um, I, th- I think there was like a 20 year age difference between all four of them, between the oldest and the youngest on this one, maybe right. pushing 30, um, between Th- Thomas and, and Kayla there. Um, there could be things like that. So I, I want to caution that just because you saw them come out on a stretcher might have been a medical thing that they were doing. Ah. on this flight um i was gonna say it might have been the astronauts doing saying we don't feel stable enough might have had something to do with how the boat was rocking you know like it's impossible to know unless you were there because the one thing nasa will outright refuse to talk about is medical conditions with astronauts right i was gonna say they probably needed to take him out of a stretcher after banging the astronaut's head on the uh console there (laughs) That too. <laughs> oh, look at this real quick. Hang on a second. Uh, I didn't notice this at the time, but watch. The infamous unbendable neck of the SpaceX spacesuit strikes again. They have to like push his head past the console to get it going. Um, I don't know if you'll ever see it. Yeah. They're like, look at the rocket. And they're like, <laughs> so they can see the rocket. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the other thing to sort of remember, too, here is that while, while the Soyuz definitely experiences the most G-forces of the crew return vehicles um, during a normal re-entry, the Dragon is still pushing four, four and a half to five during atmospheric, during the throes of atmospheric re-entry. That's a lot on your body to begin with. And that's a lot when you haven't experienced gravity for five to six months. So also depending on exactly how Dragon chose to fly the re-entry profile can affect your G-forces. So it might've also just been that they were like, we're fine, but those G-forces really got us. We just want the stretcher. Yeah. You know. Makes sense. Let's see here. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're starting to run out of time here. Yeah. That's eh. So normal. That's, as as that's, you yeah. tend to do. The cows are apparently around the cameras, too. Um, ah. <laughs> most confusing <laughs> things to say. Uh, real quick, y'all. There's a lot of super chats and stuff like that coming in. We appreciate the support, whether you're liking the stream or you just show up or you retweet things or, or whatever. Like, There's lots of different ways to support us, including the merch store. I know. Are y'all getting sick of this yet? Um, if you do want to uh, get some cool merch and show off some things. We're actually all wearing merch today. Look, you have to stand up and show your merch now. Ah. 
<laughs> Endeavor. <laughs> yesterday. It's and I'm doing what it feels like I all do. Eat, <laughs> sleep, lunch, I think, repeat. I think Chris actually wrote an article about Endeavor's first flight. Endeavor sure. Mm-hmm, Endeavor best shuttle. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you don't have on cancel. the eat, sleep, scrub, repeat shirt. Like I made sure I didn't pick that one yeah. because I very <laughs> badly dead. both got them in blue. So <laughs> I've grabbed them accidentally. Can you actually search for scrub? No, that didn't come up if you search for scrub. Do we still have that shirt in the shop? I don't even know. I don't know if we do or not. Huh. No. Well, um, we do have it the... might be in an archive somewhere, but we've got some things here. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, I guess. We, of course, have the Raptor Wrangler. Like Everybody and their dog likes yeah. to meet the Jurassic Park logo with their own little flair sort of thing, and we've got one with Raptor. It's actually based on a photo that was taken. Yeah. We took the outline of the photo, and we traced it in. None of this like copyrighted stuff or whatever. Um, we traced in our own photo and put it in the background. Um Plus, you know, the guy there in the foreground. Who knows who that guy is? I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's the design. I am, of course, modeling today. Uh, we've got the human space flight. That was a new one we did for the That was a new mission, one, yeah. Right? So the human space flight, of course, the broomstick landing, the new design for Texas Tank Watchers, which is sort of like the slightly new design at this point. Um, I think we still have that. Do, they, do we still have the they see me roll and they hate and hang on. <laughs> Yes, oh, they I do. Yes, we do. Oh, my yeah. very favorite shirt. It's the last one. Yeah. There it is. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> of course, after the not quite complete wet dress rehearsal, they saw you rolling more. So, anyways, um, there are all sorts of ways you can support uh, what we do here to keep us on the air. The merch store is a good way. Hop on over to the, pop on over to the shop. Sounds better if you say it that way. Um, if you see something you like, you can maybe get recognized. Um, somebody told me they were at the gas station the other day. They had an NSF hat, and somebody came up to them and said, Oh, NASA space flight sort of deal because we're in a hat. So nice. Whichever way, uh, if you're looking for something to wear this summer's hottest trends, quite literally, we put rocket engines on some of our designs. I'd say that qualifies as a hot trend. I'm gonna need a new mug. I have a very <laughs> anyways glass. Um, the <laughs> link, of course, is shop.nasaspaceflight.com. I'm going to spam that into the chat <laughs> really quickly. That's just another way y'all can purchase. But you don't have to financially support even just showing up, watching what we're doing, asking good questions, liking and subscribing, whatever. Um, there's all sorts of ways to support what we do. We appreciate you across the board. Ah, yes. So we still have the whole Starship portion of the show to go, <laughs> as you do. Yes. And it's not just Starship, because uh, I have continued to be very busy on our new 24-7 live stream, McGregor Live. So if you weren't aware, this is maybe the first time you've caught us since we've launched this. Uh, For just over a week now, we've had a 24-7 live stream going from McGregor, Texas, which is SpaceX's experimental rocket engine test facility up in the center of Texas, right? And uh, we have seen them do as many as eight engine tests in a day. I don't know why it's not live. I should just click live because it's actually live uh, so wasn't there yes. one where they were firing two yes. different engines on two different stands at the same time yes they, <laughs> they, that wasn't a that wasn't a dream <laughs> we saw eight in one day flip yeah we saw two at the same <laughs> time this is the vertical stand this is the horizontal stand and we saw the vertical stand going and we saw the horizontal stand going at the same time like up in the test cadence. I mean, clearly they have a lot of Raptors to test out there at McGregor. Um, we also saw one earlier today. It's Mother's Day. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day for the mothers out there. Um, but there was a test on Mother's Day. And I was going to point out, it's tough, right? Because we have 24-7 coverage on McGregor, and it's like five to seven minutes of excitement every single day, right? And it's tough. There's people over there chatting, and they're talking about engines. They're talking about bird calls and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but if you ever end up on the McGregor Live <laughs> live stream and you want to see an engine test, we have actually added a little bit of a log to the upper left-hand corner here, and we will show you all the tests that have happened today. It resets overnight, right? But we've put some cool tools in there that you can use to actually scroll back and check things out. See this right here? It says negative 202. That means from right now, from when I'm watching the video, if I scroll back two hours and two minutes, there'll be a test there. And I can do that. Y'all aren't going to see the entire bar, but uh, there's an hour 47, uh, hour 52, 201, 202. There's 202. And I just click. All of a sudden, there's a test going. I've got it muted. Hang on. There you go. I think y'all all hear that. Yeah, y'all hear that. So, uh, anyways, that's the vertical stand there going. Let's turn that down so I'm not trying to talk over it. Um, (laughs) 
when we get back into the week, I imagine we're going to get into some big test days where we see five, six, seven tests a day. So if you do happen across McGregor Live and you want to see if there are any tests, look at the log in the upper right-hand corner, and we will. Uh, you can actually see where you should scroll in the video to try and see the tests. Now, of course, we're also going to be going through and doing some, like, test updates where we put a bunch of tests together into a video and be like, crazy, SpaceX is crazy. They did eight tests today. They did 23 this week, whatever. Um, we'll be doing some edited videos as well. <laughs> the the 187 tests of the month. Yeah, yeah, right. Basically. I, I don't know what... Then we can, then, then we can have, pre, we can have like beginning of the month guesses. Like, will they break 150? Like, what's your guess for the number of engine tests this month? <laughs> it's like that, how many jelly beans are in the jar? Like, how many tests is SpaceX going to do? And, and Das, we also have something else, don't we? Also have like a, a sound graph on here, so you can oh, hear yeah. how loud the, the engines are in comparison yep. to each other. This one, this one is a little quiet, but uh, you can see there's actually a live graph of the sound level. It's just generic relative sound level. It's not like by decibels or anything, but you can actually see them throttling the engines up and down as the graph gets a little taller and a little bit shorter. Uh, that actually marches across the screen. See, people say it looks like an iceberg going across the screen sometimes, but uh, if you see that on the screen. <laughs> You can scroll yeah, it's back. Like an iceberg. It is. It's like an iceberg, like going across the screen. Um, Especially when it's on one of the other ones where it's louder. Yep. It just goes. Like, it grows bigger, and it's just like. Ooh. Yeah, I don't. I don't have. Yeah. Um, I don't have one that actually has that on it. But I do have another test I brought up because this is one of the loud tests. Let's see here. There it goes. Does a little train thing. Anyways, we could just sit there. I was joking that our update video should just be all the tests for the week, just back to back. And then there's no narration. There's no information. It's just a bunch of rocket noises. I don't know if y'all would like that or not. Um, but I mean. <laughs> we're going to run over for sure because we need to talk about SpaceX and Boca Chica and Starship and environmental assessments and paperwork and all sorts of things going on there. So this I, time it's good news, though. I, I think that's some of the big news. Uh, take it away, Alex. What are we? Uh, what do we see happening here? Oh yeah, we saw these. I think it was this Friday. We saw the the FA updating their website, saying that the Section One Hundred Six review is complete. So we have four of the five steps already complete on the programmatic and environmental assessment. So that's going to be very very exciting to see. Um, you know that th th there's there's a good chance that we actually get the the whole review finalized this this month. So that's going to be that's going to be really I don't know um, <laughs> I don't know how to, how to say it's just like good? really re really exciting that the fabled report becomes reality. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, again, it's not completely done. And the 29th, exactly. end of April, the big news was, oh, my gosh, they've pushed it back again. And it wasn't just that they were pushing it back. It's that they did push it back. But some of the things got completed, and some of them weren't pushed back a month. They were pushed back a couple days. And we have seen those other... Is the right way to say it that, uh, that there are other agencies that have other reports to put in? And... The FAA was sort of waiting on some of those, and those are getting ticked off. So more and more pieces of the puzzle are coming together, and it's looking, knock on wood, more and more likely that maybe at the end of this month we'll actually get that uh, environmental assessment all the way out. But we said this looked good, right? Why did this look good? Yeah. I thought they were talking about the piping plover having its nest destroyed by rockets actively blowing them up or something. <laughs> like, what's? why is this good? Well, that was that was something that that will have been with the other one that was complete last week, which was the Endangered Species Act, that was complete completed I think on the thirtieth or or the 29th. ninth, uh, actually the 29th because it was a Friday, <laughs> the thirtieth was was on on Saturday, yeah, and and you know the this one had more to do with like historical stuff right there, you know, related with the U.S. Civil War, right. And they had some concerns, but just because it was completed, we actually don't know what's the outcome. That's all going to be, you know, uh, put together by the FA and say, hey, you know, you got to do this. And so that's going to be the end result, which hopefully it's going to come out 
by the end of this month and they're gonna you know they're, they're gonna they're gonna say something at one point we just unsure if it's gonna be by the end of this month or not but these things being completed already do give us hope that that's gonna be a thing by the end of this month so we'll see just cross our fingers and and expect uh what we hope can happens with which is a a fancy i think we explained that last week on nsf live which meant uh finding of no significant impact the fancy and most likely yeah most likely it's going to be a mitigated one which can also happen it's sort of like an in between between a, a fancy yeah like like just don't do anything it's already okay you know and and you know the the other end of the spectrum is doing a full on environmental impact statement where they gonna like they will have to spend a whole year just at least a year you know to to be able to study the environmental impacts of all the activities and everything so my, my hope and i think the most the most likely outcome is going to be probably something in between which is the the um ah uh, please the the ah uh, I, I lost the, the word the mitigated yeah that's the word that's right mitigated uh fancy which is like yeah it's not a lot of impact but you gotta do stuff so that your impact is lower and then we'll see you know it's it's sort of like that so that that wouldn't delay things that much is also likely that spacex has already been working on these mitigations for for all this time right uh we saw some some stuff also uh coming out to light this week about some kind of concerns that they had had with the like what you said with with some birds and things like that some dangerous species out there and we also saw some of the comments by the faa saying that they will basically they, they were basically um changing some of the some of the stuff that was in the application things like that right so it's likely that spacex is already putting some of these mitigations up front just to save some of that time they were like backing off power generation requirements and stuff like that weren't they there were a couple things that spacex was sort of pulling back on a little bit i think so Mm. let's see here um we also have booster seven rising from the dead (laughs) who's talking (laughs) about booster Booster seven rising from the dead (laughs) this was interesting wasn't it alex yeah we saw that leaked photo we i think we all saw that right and it was it was a little bit crunchy the 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 transfer to and i'm transfer to uh team by the way people say down comer it's okay it's it's technically okay but i'm transfer to uh team uh so it was a little bit crunchy we saw also some panels go inside the lux tank uh via one of the mary uh dailies and suddenly, you know, after all of these things that we saw, it went out to the launch site. So it's obviously at least good enough to be put back in the in the overall launch mount and be tested. We don't know yet if like I I don't think it's gonna it's not like I don't think it's it's gonna fly. Uh, I, I think it's more likely that they're gonna use all of these right. to be able to to test some improvements for booster eight so that they don't repeat. The same mistakes either design or procedural you know with booster aid which is just coming down the line it's right off the corner literally so yeah so it, it like, like we said we saw them doing some repairs to it the big question was if the internal piping got crushed due to a pressure differential how the heck are you going to replace all that piping, right? And we were like, are they going to cut it in half? Are they going to bring a whole new pipe in, et cetera, et cetera? Because usually they put the transfer tubes in there while they're assembling the rest of the rocket. So it's all taken apart, and then you put what you need in the middle, and then you weld it all together, right? And that's what we were talking about. We actually saw them passing some of these, I guess, replacement parts to rebuild it in situ yeah. through the little hatch in the side of the thing. So instead of one big, already assembled tube, they passed in two bits panels yeah panels and, yeah the, the panels yep. they were curved panels and you could see like it was very obvious that they would be they, like if, if you join them together they form like a ring and then you put like yeah it's just parts of the tube which is like that's super 
uh, it's it's just too janky but hey <laughs> if it works it works it's <laughs> janky <laughs> and if it and if it fails you know they still have boost rate yep. this is like this is the whole deal you know that um they're gonna try it just try it it's it, like there's there's nothing wrong trying it yeah and and if it fails it fails and and it's gonna be tested with liquid nitrogen at the end of the day so that's an inert uh, material you know and and so if it fails and the boost booster seven splashes or something that's okay just prepare it you know roll out boost rate and send send that one yeah, I, I imagine <laughs> we're going to see like a test campaign come up with Booster 7 that includes all the GSE, like all the things we've been talking about, moving cryogenic liquids around. Can you pump it? Can you defill it? Can you do all the things? They, they need more experience with that, and I think they're going to continue to test with that. And I imagine they're not going to do anything that would really drastically endanger the ground infrastructure. So, you exactly. know, catching a booster falling out of the sky, like, no, nah, man, <laughs> we're not going to try that. Um, <laughs> we're going to do some, like, cryo tests, some proof tests sort of things. Pump, like I said, pumping the cryogenic liquids around. Things that don't endanger greatly the rest of stage zero so that if, you know, this new repair they did doesn't work the way they had hoped or if they find another link or some something that expands and pops off or whatever it is, right? Remember, we don't get a lot of detailed information back from SpaceX on exactly what happens. There's yeah. what we can see, but it's not like somebody comes out and issues a press release saying, and now the third valve on the booster was stuck for two hours. Like, we don't get that level of detail, <laughs> right? Um, and so they're going to be doing testing. Of course, we'll be watching the testing on Starbase Live. We'll maybe spool up a commentated stream um, if we see something and it's super interesting, but as of right now, and lots of raptor sides, lots too. of raptor sides. They're back. <laughs> you gotta have a look out for that. That's our, our commentary that we do on Starbase Live. So every now and then, we just turn on the microphone and start talking about stuff, um, current events, what's on the screen. We point the cameras around or whatever, and uh, those just happen mm. right on Starbase Live. But we imagine we're expecting them to go through a test campaign with Booster 7, sort of restricted to things that aren't going to jeopardize a bunch of other stuff, but more data, more experience. That's what they're doing. The thing that you get to see at Starbase is building the machine that builds the machine. All the development sort of out in the open that we can see. They're literally building Stage 0 and all the support equipment right where we can see what's going on. So learning how that works and getting experience with it is a very valuable thing. That's honestly why the Rocket Graveyard is full. They don't need, like, yeah. they need <laughs> to learn to build them. And if you weld one together and you yeah. park it in the back 40, you've still learned how to weld it together and how to move it and how to lift things and how to fit things together. And then you make improvements like all of that. They could scrap 10 starships and just leave them in the back 40 or donate them to the airport or whatever, right? But they're still getting useful experience and they're getting useful data on the process to manufacture the things. I'm talking a lot. I know. Someone is saying on chat, uh, the Raptor site lift was great because we had a Raptor site and suddenly Booster 7 was lifted on the OLM. That's right. And actually, I yes. must point out that every every Raptor site chat that we have done in the past two weeks has had something interesting going on. So I think we should make more of those just for people to be able to see more stuff. <laughs> it makes things go on at Starbase when we have like a Raptor site. Yeah, the first one last last week, uh, we had Elon tweeting Raptor photos and everything, and then the other one, uh, we we debuted McGregor live, and there was a a, a Raptor firing, <laughs> right right when when we were doing it. Yep. And now we had Booster Seven lifted on the OLN, so that was really great timing. Yep. <laughs> we need more Raptor sites. Of course, in this <laughs> shot, you can see to. no engines underneath. <laughs> It's got all yeah. the engine guts and components, yeah. sort of not engine guts really, the the lines and attach points and stuff for the engines, but no engines on board. So, I'm also remembering uh, one comment that I made the last time that I was on the NSF Live, my first NSF Live. They actually sent uh, Booster Seven, like like that was the, the moment they sent first time Booster Seven to the OLM, and oh yeah, that lift, <laughs> so <laughs> weird thing there. I actually made one comment because people talk about the can crusher and I was like, no, they're gonna they're not gonna crush it, you know, but you know, just don't listen to me, they actually crushed it. <laughs> just not from the outside, from the inside. From the, from inside. the yeah. 
I think we all, I think we all, yeah. I think we all got that wrong technically, right? <laughs> Little did you know that uh, the booster itself is a can <laughs> yes. crusher, right? <laughs> yeah. There's um, a can crusher from the inside. <laughs> and then, of course, Booster 7 making it back out there. Uh, we we're joking, rising from the dead. SpaceX is going to continue to get good experience and data from it. And we just uh, saw some preparations for Ship 24. I think this is Ship 24 pieces rolling around, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, the tank section yeah. over there. It's actually not the entire tank section. It's missing the forward zone. But... Right. For all intents and purposes, it's just basically a tent section. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> and then I think, did they ever finish it? Like on Starbase Live earlier, they had the nose cone moving around. Did they, did they actually finish that yeah. lift? Actually, if people are watching, I hope Live. you are watching Starbase Live. You can just <laughs> scroll back and look the, at the operation. It was like, whoop, whoop. It's, <laughs> it's just lift, move over, and down. Yeah. It's very simple. It's like, I'm just going to go to nsf.live slash starship or yeah, starbase just, and, uh, yeah, just a scroll back yeah okay in this shot it's already there god this actually needs a list of events so that i know what to scroll back to okay well we need, <laughs> we need that for starbase live i guess <laughs> yeah there we go yeah so we haven't even made an edited video <laughs> of this yet this will be in the daily that we put together tonight but on starbase live Indeed. it's right there on the tin live uh, you could see this happening earlier today as they Force time lapse. Look, I'm just going to try to fast forward, and works way better when you use actual editing software. What is this? Bandy and camp? no raptor side or anything, yo. It's yeah. like, <laughs> Jeez. We, we Stuff didn't just have raptor side and just kept happening. That's weird. <laughs> they're rotating it. That's what they're doing. Start moving over. Anyways, y'all get the point. Oh, it, it, there, there we go. Now it's going. <laughs> I just watch the daily. Time lapse. Just <laughs> watch the daily <laughs> video if you want to see that actually time lapsed. <laughs> aro, aro, aro. <laughs> just time, time lapse. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's still a lot of stuff happening at Starbase. There's the environmental assessment that got some more checkboxes checked off important stuff and some of the things we heard on that were not terrible it wasn't oh my gosh this bird will never live again if you let them fly rockets from there it was well there'll be an impact here's some things you can do to fix the impacts or to mitigate the impacts like alex was saying um booster seven we thought it was going to the scrap pile maybe but spacex learned some procedure they repaired it in place they put new esophagus in it or whatever you want to call that tube <laughs> and uh, yeah. it's really the esophagus of the rocket i don't know um but they they repaired that uh and rolled it back out to the pad and then ship 24 continuing to make progress as well um that we saw just earlier today so things continue to push forward for starbase we haven't seen like an entire shut down everything and move to Florida. Um, they're still pushing ahead. It seems like they've got a pretty high level of confidence they're going to be able to fly from there, right, y'all? Yeah. Seems like, yeah. All right. Mm. Seems like. We definitely owe some questions here because we are a couple minutes over. Yeah. Alex, Chris, tell me sneakily course, in the back yep. channel if you have to leave. You don't have to say it out loud. Um, I'm okay. Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Douglas Richardson, 20 bucks says, don't lose your humor. It's fun from a fellow tank watcher. Thank you, Douglas. Yeah. Good. I'm <laughs> glad you like our humor. <laughs> I hope people don't come over there and over to the show and they're like, oh my gosh, that DOS guy is on again. It's just can't take anything seriously. <laughs> um, it is, it is fun. It's, it's interesting stuff to me. I'd like to tell jokes about it. I hope that they're interesting. Um, we do have a lot of fun with, with our shows. So thank you for the kind words, Douglas. And I don't, I don't want to miss this one either. Um, NX39 a while ago, was telling something about a scam going on on YouTube. I, I think it's probably about one of those wacky live streams that aren't actually live or something. Oh, yeah. Those you know, things, yeah. it's like, big announcement. Elon says, like, live right now, SpaceX, new 90-meter yeah, Starship or whatever. And then they put, scam. they put bots on them, so it looks like there's 10,000 people watching, and you're like, are you freaking kidding me? And it's all like, <laughs> send .03F to this for the latest news or whatever. Um, I, I don't know the specific one you were talking about, but please always be careful for stuff like that. I don't know exactly what the Crew 4 scam that you're speaking of is, but just be on the lookout. You know, be smart when watching things. Mm. Uh, Jim Cavett, late breaking super chat says thanks you all. Um, let's see here. Let's grab a couple questions. 
Star Factory. I didn't say anything about Star Factory. I didn't see anything either. That's I know that thing. being, you know, it's it's been progressing. It's being, it's still being built. Like yep. nothing has stopped there, at least. <laughs> I'm actually don't, don't panic. Scrolling <laughs> around in uh, Starbase Live, trying to find a shot of Star Factory, but uh, they continued to put up the the big production area that will be a little bit yeah. better than just tents on the beach, right? I've seen. <laughs> like it's it's just a minor thing but i i've seen like some kind of opening they're, they're starting to put the like the the beams for the for the walls and yep. they left one opening which is that's where the door is going to be on <laughs> <laughs> yeah when you see the big opening you know that's where things are going to be rolling off i yeah i'm tempted to actually just commandeer a Starbase live camera and pointed at Star Factory right now, but I'll I'll focus on answering more questions instead of playing with robot cameras. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, geez. People are asking about the mystery box. The mystery box. And, yeah. Tell us about the, the mystery, mystery box. box. It's very mysterious. <laughs> let's say that. <laughs> I have no idea. I have my you know theory a little theory that it will be perhaps for some kind of um because i'm, I'm gonna reset a little bit here yeah uh on the high bay one the older one <laughs> uh they have an enclosure some kind of box thingy for the for the robots to be able to weld the pieces once they're stacking and everything yep yep and so it kind of looked like that at first. Now it's like, uh, I have no idea what they're doing with it. So I, I, like my theory is just like a little bit sinking, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea. <laughs> it looks honest. so rusty. Whatever it's it like, is. It's the rusty yeah. panels you're putting together, SpaceX. Come on. Yeah. And it's no, the it's confused not a water media tower. box. <laughs> the yeah, that too. The confused media <laughs> box. You know, I wouldn't put it past them. They're just like, let's toss together a big rusty, rusty box. You know, everybody's going to take pictures of it. There's like 15 people yeah, over there just, taking pictures of the rusty box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Let's, uh, oh, wow. I don't have this one queued up. Did y'all see that uh, successful one kilometer test out of China? Oh, what was yeah. that? Hi, I'm, I don't remember now the name. Hold on. I'm going to look yeah. up on our discord server uh, because we have a lot of people that actually a successful one kilometer that. flight okay yeah yeah i'm trying to find oh, it what's uh, the name? deep Coffee blue thing. aerospace deep yeah deep blue uh, aerospace that's what it was nebula m1 was yeah. the yeah right now looking at it yeah we have a lot of people that are actually dedicated you know in, in in our discord server and post all of these news which then we can basically talk about yeah. later I'll bring Just it up real nice. quick. Um, it's a rocket, small landing legs on it, takes off vertically with the landing legs ah. out. Flies. Oh, a landing test. Yes. 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 Um, I saw this. I mean, I, I don't want to spend too much time, but uh, it goes up. There's a cool drone shot of it. It hovers over some rice, I think, and then it comes back down. It's got a lot of oscillation. Like, it looks like the tuning in the... Uh, Look at the thrust vectoring, and it's constantly oh, waggling yeah. back and forth. Yeah. It makes it through. But the big thing that people were pointing out on Twitter was that for some reason, it seems that the end of this video is edited. And they actually hmm. slowed it down right before it touched the ground to make it look like it landed. Oh. <laughs> and people were thinking that it hit the ground a lot harder, and then the video cut before the, the dust clears. So if you mm. watch the motion of the dust and the flags waving, somebody slowed that video down to make it look like it was slowing down when it approached yeah. the ground. Yeah. And it hit pretty hard. You can see the tip of the nose cone up at the top of it, but uh, that was a pretty hard hit. Boop. Oh, well. Anyways. Yeah. It's not all so straight it's, as it comes yeah. down. It looks like, I mean, they stopped the video and the nose cone is sort of over to one side a little bit. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, it's weird. The tweet is saying SpaceX has a rival. Well, they're here, like maybe. SpaceX, you just recover all the pieces and build well, another one. And to be fair, that tweet <laughs> does say it completed a one kilometer vertical takeoff and landing yes, test flight. It did. Technically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I, of course, seeing more people do that. 
Yes. More and more companies are going to do that. We've seen a couple different prototypes, and it's it's always like, oh, another SpaceX. Oh, SpaceX has a rival. And, I mean, that one video, I'm not ready to put my payload on that rocket, or y'all. <laughs> Uh, no, I, 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 I want to hear the confirmation of a successful landing and see the video to prove it. There you go. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Good. More questions about the mystery box. We did talk about the mystery box. Um, somebody yelled, what's in the box? Very funny. Uh, let's <laughs> see. Box. Just repairs. I, I mean, there are some people saying that isn't the whole idea of using stainless steel that it's easy to repair. Was that a driving factor behind Starship being stainless steel, or...? I thought it was the rigidity and the strength it gives you in the almost non-existent need for a heat shield, depending on exactly what your vehicle is, were the driving factors yeah, of it. Yeah. I think it's, like, there's some cost differences as well, and then once you just build a rocket big enough, you just have so much fuel and so much engine, like, the, the mass of the stainless steel doesn't really matter. Um, is another big part of it. I mean, there's all sorts of things that go into Starship and why it's designed the way that it is. Yeah. But uh, anyway. It's probably also not ideal that you basically have, like, if, if you're breaking the booster or something and then you're running it to 50 flights or something and it has patches of stuff all over the place or something, yeah. that's probably not ideal. Probably, especially, especially for refurbishment because then you have to look up, you know, the the wells, they, they're still in in great shape and everything so it's good that they're testing probably for future proofing uh repairs and everything but that's probably not the ideal situation because then you gotta look that the wells are already you know like they're they're okay after each flight and yep. everything so that complicates refurbishment right and so you don't want that kind of stuff yep even though it's it's great to have but it's not the ideal situation yeah obviously you get into all sorts of things like the weld stretching as cryofluids go through things and temperatures changes and elasticity and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I, I don't know that SpaceX ever intentionally intended to replace a downcomer in the center of the booster. I'm not sure they crushed that thing intentionally to see how they could repair it. Um, <laughs> but it, it is interesting to see that they were literally passing those panels through the hatch and uh, allegedly, I mean, we haven't seen a photo of the inside of it, but yeah. they may have rebuilt it completely from pieces. So People are making jokes about the box. You know what the box is probably for? It's for those birds. They are in danger. They need the the, the box. To uh, the birds. It's like a blast shield for the piping plovers <laughs> or something. It's like, what are they going to do? Put up a sign that says "nest here, piping plovers." <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I I should have looked this up, but I, I I do they even nest there? Is that the non-breeding area? I saw the graph, and it's the, do they go north and breed, then they come south and hang out, then they go, is, or is it the other way around? I don't, I, I don't want to say it wrong, Chad. I don't know if that's the right way to do it, or like what the right way is. But anyways, there was a whole thing about like, oh well, you know, this amount of the nesting area or the, the habitat or whatever would be impacted. But then somebody posted up this huge graph of like, wait, or a map of all this piping plover territory. Yeah, someone, someone is saying also in chat that stainless can be easily checked with x-rays for stretch damage. But if your goal is to reuse it within an hour yeah. of lending, especially the booster, you don't have a lot, a lot of time to then go and check the wells with a, with x-rays. So You mean you can't just wheel a machine up in an hour and go... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least you have like some, some sort of TSA kind of machine, you know, giant building that just rolls <laughs> and scans. Just roll it through the x-ray machine. I but... don't think, I don't think, yeah. I don't think that's God, the Imagine the, the radiation protection things those people would need. <laughs> oh, jeez. That, that, would, that would need a, <laughs> an EIS. <laughs> uh, just aim From it toward one of those x-ray producing things in space. That'll do it, right? <laughs> um, Maybe what, that's what the box is we're like, for. <laughs> we're like 18 minutes over now, but you know our start and stop times are like a no earlier than uh, when we publish yeah. these things. So let me see if I can't completely randomly get, grab one more question. For, oh, how are the bluebirds doing? I'm glad you asked. The bluebirds oh. have been doing fantastically. Oh. Uh, <laughs> We're coming up on the time for them to actually fledge to leave the nest. They're so big now that the parents don't even enter the nest. Like, they'll still come up and feed them through the hole, but 
mom and dad don't go in the nest anymore. Um, we've seen them doing some flight checks with their wings. So they've actually, they'll get up and they spread their wings in the nest. And they sort of flutter, like working out their wings. They're sticking their head out the door. Of course, they're not going to do this. This is live right now. Uh, they're not going to do this right now. But uh, the bluebirds, I think we're coming up on, was it eight plus seven? So six, do, 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 do. What is that trying to 15 days old and they're supposed to fledge between 15 and 20 days. So in the next couple days, this of course is my other live stream. I run from my back deck. Y'all <laughs> one of the mini cameras that I have <laughs> out um, are our Eastern bluebirds out here, but they've been doing fine. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Anyways, when bluebird hop, Aww, it's coming up, Tom, the bluebird. it's coming up. You'll see them coming, and then they fly and they like land on the deck and then they go down and they flutter down to a bush. Like, they're not exactly rate positive. They can't go up. They can just not fall as fast by flapping their wings when they come out. So anyways, they're super active. Great question. Thanks for asking about the bluebirds. <laughs> Did we miss anything else, y'all? Chris, Alex? Uh, I think with the bluebirds, we got it all. Whew. Good <laughs> thing. Yeah. I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're interested, I'll just put a link to the bluebirds. It's Egress Productions is what I do that under. So you can go and check out the bluebirds. They're awesome. <laughs> Well, that's the end of the show. <laughs> um, let's see here. I think we've talked through all the different things we were supposed to talk through today. Uh, we talked about Starship, SN11 going back out, Ship 24 getting stacked, environmental assessments, more information coming up. Uh, we talked about Starliner. Oh, look, look. <laughs> sorry. Oh, I'm not even sorry. Back. Nice. That's Dad. Dad's, that's dad's dad. Dad's super blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Mom's yeah, very no, I, I realized what I said as soon as I said it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all good. They're just like, it's like a mosh pit in there whenever our parents comes up. They all are beep, 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 beep. I don't have the microphone. There's a microphone inside the box as well. Anyways, no more bluebirds. Uh, ingenuity. Good news can, for the Ingenuity teams. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah. I was I was just saying that we can make a note of what things to expect next week. There's mom. And you know where <laughs> you know where to where to find things next week on Nexus Space Flight. There you go. Michael's app, you know, the Michael uh, website. He has a lot of the upcoming launches next week. We have two Starlinks, Chinese launches. We have, you know, all all of the all of the stuff right there. I'm rapidly typing nextbayflight.com, but it actually is much better in the app. Typing. Not going to lie. Yeah, like, yeah. there you go. Um, nextbayflight.com, the website and the app there we go. on Android. And the App Store, I tunes whatever the heck it's called i don't know uh you can get a list of what's coming up next so we'll be out there for the starlinks right we got one from vandy and one from the mm -hmm. cape so Happy jack that's true yeah. vandenberg launch we'll be doing some of that <laughs> hope for no fog but i do believe that uh that is going to bring us to the end of today's show running 22 minutes longer than it's supposed to i'm not keeping track of <laughs> y'all <laughs> i'm not <laughs> Anyways, uh, as always, y'all, tons of questions come through. There's no way that we can get all the questions in um, on chat, but we do appreciate y'all asking questions. Uh, if you popped by the merch shop, picked up one of the T-shirts or something, if you did a super chat over the course of the stream, um, even if you just showed up and hung out with us today, thank you so much for supporting what we do here. Again, with me today, Mr. Alejandro Alcan uh, oh, Alcantaria. Did I get it right? Alex. Alex, just call me Alex. Alex. <laughs> my my last name is just so weird. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Alex, for joining us today. We appreciate you. <laughs> yeah. It's it's been it's been a great time here. Yeah. Good times. And then also, Mr. Chris Gebhardt. Chris, thank you so much for the time today. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Um, hey, happy Mother's Day to all of the uh, moms, whatever sort of mother you are, um, out there today. Thank you all so much. And I need to call my dear sweet mother. She's a very classy lady, and I'm lucky to have her. As soon as I get off here, I'll give her a call. I haven't gotten any angry text messages on my phone like, you did the show and you didn't call me yet. Um, she doesn't <laughs> tend to do things like that. But uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. And that is going to bring us to the end of today's show. I'm John Galloway. You may know me as Das if you're watching over on Twitch. Haven't forgot about you, Twitch. Hi. Uh, but that's the end of the show today. Thanks so much for hanging out with us, and we will see you nerds later. Well, it's going to be a surprise. I don't know if this is going to go to uh, Starbase Live or McGregor Live, but if you stick around, we'll see which stream Michael sends you to. We'll <laughs> see. Play the music.
Terminal. I think the achiever pressure looks good. Call right now. Yikes, you bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these.